Leviticus chapter 16, <clears throat> and verse number 1. We're going to read uh, some, somewhat of a lengthy portion. So please work at listening, work at paying attention this morning. Leviticus chapter 16, verse number 1. We read through verse number 10, and then we'll look at a few verses after that the same chapter. Leviticus chapter number 16 in verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord and died. Now let me stop here and ask you a question. Who were, who were these two sons? Anybody remember their names? Nadab and Abihu. They offered strange fire to the Lord. I believe they were charging in. They were going into uh, behind the uh, veil there they were trying to go behind the veil because they had the incense and that was kind of the purpose of that incense was to shield you from the Shekinah glory you know I'm just kidding she shields you from the uh, that's not in the Bible okay but shields you from the brightness of the Lord's presence there in the cloud above the cherubims above the mercy seat there that the incense was to shield them and they they took the incense and uh, they were, it seems like to me they were going in there and, and God struck them dead. Uh, and, uh, but also, I believe, because they offered strange fire, the Bible says. Uh, and there's a lot of strange fire being offered today in the name of Christianity. You get a lot of churches and there's a lot of strange behavior, a lot of strange things going on, a lot of strange music, and a lot of strange behavior. But look at verse number two. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. One of the reasons why I believe that Nadab and Abihu tried to go into uh, the Holy of Holies is because right here, after it talks about them uh, dying, it brings up the fact that you know Aaron's not supposed to go back there any time. He's not supposed to go back there at all times. He's supposed to go back there at a specific time, once a year on the Day of Atonement, and that's what this chapter is about. This chapter is about uh, the Day of Atonement. Verse three: Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat. <laughs> okay, so notice that. Coat, word coat. Okay, uh, don't believe this nonsense about, you know, men wearing dresses back then. Okay, he wore a coat. And it says, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh. What does breeches sound like? Sounds like our word britches, right? So again, don't believe that nonsense that men didn't wear pants in the Bible and they wore dresses, okay? That's nonsense. Breeches or hosen was the garment that pertained to men in the Bible, okay? And he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle. And with the linen miter shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats. Kids is just reference to baby goats. Two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat. So they're trying to figure out, they're casting lots, they're trying to figure out, they've got these two goats at the door of the tabernacle, they're trying to figure out which one's going to get killed, which one's going to be the scapegoat. It'd kind of be like, rock, paper, scissors, or, you know, casting lots, they more than likely had straws and they would see. Uh, so it would kind of be like flipping a coin or something along those lines. All right, Leviticus 16, verse 9. 
And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So this is the goat that's going to be killed. This one's going to be the sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented, don't miss this, alive. The scapegoat was to be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat to the wilderness. Now jump down to verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel in all their transgressions, in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat into, in, in, he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Now the events that we just read about deal with the Day of Atonement. If you study this out, you will see that this happened once per year. And I believe was the most important of all the ordinances given to the nation of Israel. This was the one time all year that the priest would go behind the veil to make atonement for all the sins of the entire Congregation. Now first Aaron, the high priest, he would bathe himself, put on proper clothing. He would offer a sin offering for himself and those priests that were of his house, the other high priests. And then next the high priest would present two goats as a sin offering for the people. One was slain. The other one was sent into the wilderness as a scapegoat. The live goat was the removing goat. The live goat was the one that removed the sins uh, of the nation, symbolizing the removal of Israel's sins. It was just, <clears throat> I don't believe it fully removed their sins. The Bible says blood of bulls and goats, you know, didn't wash away man's sin. But symbolically, it removed their sins, and, and, and or, 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 or it just pacified God. It appeased God for a little time. Basically, what it did is it held God's hand of judgment back up until it could be, come down on His Son, until judgment it could fall on His Son. Okay, so it did, in a sense, atone for sin. It did, in a sense, appease the Lord, pacify the Lord, satisfy the Lord. Okay, it did. But it didn't completely remove sin. That didn't happen until Jesus Christ, okay? But the live goat was the removing goat, symbolizing the removal of Israel's sins. And that's what I want to preach on this morning. Now, one of my pastors used to say, everything worth a plug nickel came from the Bible. I'm sure everybody in this room has heard that term before, the scapegoat. Now that's a word that even the world uses. But where did that term come from? It came from your King James Bible. Amen. Amen. Right. Now the title of my sermon this morning is The Scapegoat. Let's pray. Father God, I pray you forgive me for my sins. I pray you forgive me from anything that would hinder me from being used of you this morning. I thank you for this truth, Lord. I pray you'd help me to deliver it. I pray this will be a help to our people. And you would help me to be a help to our people. I pray you'd use me in spite of me this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now the book of Colossians and the book of Hebrews both teach us that the Old Testament ceremonial laws and ordinances were a shadow of heavenly things and good things to come. They pointed to what Jesus would do one day. Now, one goat that was slain and its blood was taken behind a veil and it was sprinkled on the mercy seat as a sin offering. 
So we got one goat slain. One goat had its blood drained out. Had that blood taken, sprinkled on the mercy seat. What does this point to? What was that a shadow of? That was a shadow of what Jesus, I believe, would do in his flesh on the cross. Okay. Now the other goat had to be led or pointed to the wilderness by a fit man. Now it couldn't be just any old man. That goat more than likely would be bucking, refused to go, maybe put up a fight. It had to be a fit man. It had to be a strong man that could handle the job and lead this goat or direct this goat to the wilderness. Now this also points to our Savior. It couldn't be just any old man to die on the cross. It had to be huh, a fit man. One that was fit for the job. It had to be someone that was sinless, spotless. It had to be the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. It had to be the God man. It had to be the 100% man, but 100% God man. Amen. Amen. Now one goat bled and died. And one goat lived. One goat lived to take the sins into the wilderness, but he never died. He never died. Anybody see where I'm going with this? He never died. Now there's nothing incidental, accidental, or coincidental in the Word of God. If the New Testament tells us these things are shadows to point to Jesus... That is no exception. Amen. That whole part about the one goat not dying, the one goat living, that's no exception. Okay? Now this is a very significant event. When the blood was taken behind the, uh, the Holy of Holies, taken behind the veil into the Holy of Holies once a year to make atonement, you better believe this is a significant event. Amen. This is a huge event. This has to picture something. This live goat carrying our sins away and not dying, but carrying our sins away into the wilderness has to picture something very important. Now for the longest time, that really never made that much sense to me. Why? I don't understand. I just thought to myself, you know, I don't understand why this one goat goes free. I don't understand it. But in light of things that I've been studying over the past few years concerning the finished work of the cross, I think I finally understand it. I think I, I, think I finally understand this. After 20-some years of studying the Bible, about 25 years of studying the Bible, I think I finally understand this. Now turn to Colossians 2.14. Colossians 2.14. The dead goat pictures what Jesus did in his flesh on the cross. And I believe, I submit to you, that the live goat pictures what Jesus did after the cross. Look at Colossians 2, verse number 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So in verse 14, we have the cross. Then we go uh, from the cross to Jesus triumphing. Everybody see that? No work, no suffering, all victory. After the cross, it was all victory for our Savior. So I submit to you that when He descended into hell, and let me remind you, He descended into hell, a controlled descent. He didn't fall like a, uh, like a sinner who had been cast into hell. He had a controlled descent into hell. And to, I, I, I submit to you that He took all our sins with Him to deposit them in the wilderness of sin. Or what the Bible calls the nethermost parts of the earth. That he took and deposited our 
sins because it was all victory. It was all triumph afterwards. It went from the cross to triumphing. I believe that was one of the things he was triumphant about. The fact that he was discarding or disposing or depositing those sins in the wilderness of sin, the nethermost parts of the earth. You say, well, it had to be a land not inhabited. You say, well, if it's in keeping with the shadow of the scapegoat, it had to be a land not inhabited, and hell is definitely inhabited. Now, sure it is. Sure hell is inhabited, but there is one person that will never inhabit hell, and that's a saved child of God. Amen? Amen. The born-again child of God. Hell is an, un an uninhabited place for us because we'll never go there. We'll never inhabit that. The Bible says we who are saved will never even taste of that place. The second death has no power over us. Praise God, hell will never be inhabited by one saved person. Amen. Not one born again, not one blood washed, not one saved person. Hell will never be inhabited by one saved person. You say, well, he had to take our sins to a place that was as far as the east is from the west. Amen. Amen. Hell is described as a bottomless pit, so that puts our sins as far as the east is from the west. They're still falling, and they'll never find their way back to us. Amen? Amen. That puts our sins as far as the east is from the west. Now go to Leviticus 16, verse 10. Leviticus 16, verse number 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him to let him go for a scapegoat to the wilderness. So I want to emphasize this morning that the second goat had to be alive. That second goat had to be alive. If he would have been dead, atonement would have never happened. Now, some preach that the soul of Jesus died in hell as a part of the atonement process. But if that were true, atonement would have not been made because Jesus Christ would have ceased to be God. He would have ceased to be God. Now turn to 1 Peter 3.18. 1 Peter 3.18. While you're turning to 1 Peter 3.18, I'll read a very familiar passage from Hebrews 2.14. Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. I like that word part. He took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had power over death. That is the devil. Amen. So I said I like that word part. <laughs> that was the flesh. That part is talking about there. He took part of the same. That was the flesh and blood part that made Jesus capable of death. Amen. The flesh and blood body that God prepared for him and formed in Mary's womb is what made him capable of dying. And you know what that word conceived? That's what that word conceived means. It means formed in the womb. When God formed that baby Jesus, that flesh and blood body in the womb, that's what made him capable of dying. Okay? Amen. And conceived does not mean her fertilized eggs. That is extra biblical and that is Mormonish. That's not what conceived means. It means formed in the womb. So that body that God formed for Jesus in Mary's womb was the only thing that made him capable of death. Outside of that body, there was no death for Jesus. That was the purpose of the body. That's why he had to have the body. Now look at 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh. So it couldn't be any clearer. He suffered for sins one time, and where did he do that? In this flesh. 
But I like it when it, what it says here, immediately after it says being put to death in the flesh, it says, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So as soon as it tells us that he was put to death in the flesh, or as soon as it tells us he was put to death, it specifies in the flesh. Everybody see that? It specifies in the flesh and only in the flesh because that was all that was possible. Amen. That was the only death that was possible for Jesus Christ. The outside died, but what was on the inside never died. Amen. It couldn't die. The outside died, but what was on the inside, it was impossible to die. Amen? Amen. What was on the inside remained alive because outside of a human body, it couldn't die. God couldn't die outside of a human body. Now, I want to talk to you the rest of the sermon about what old timers referred to as the substitutionary death of Christ. Who's heard that term before? The substitutionary death of Christ. I was listening to a preacher recently that was from Texas. He's gone on to be with the Lord. And he said preachers across America need to preach about the substitutionary death of Christ. And I said, Amen. But we have to understand it first. We have to understand what it is and where it took place. The substitutionary death of Christ. What I want to talk to you about this morning. Turn to Isaiah 53. Now last week I preached a, a more challenging uh, a sermon, uh, a more, uh, you know, more bombastic or hard, hard, you know, style sermon to challenge you to live for the Lord. Now I'm going to just kind of give you some, try to help, help you have some knowledge. You know, we talked about Thursday night, how there's strength in knowledge, amen. Strength in understanding the scripture. Strength in understanding key doctrines. Strength in understanding types like the scapegoat. The type of the scapegoat should excite you. Amen. should give you uh, love and zeal and, and, and passion for the Word of God. It should excite you and give you strength to help you. Amen? Amen. So this morning is going to be a little more teachy. Uh, turn to Isaiah 53 if you would. I want you to park it there. The best way to get Isaiah is go to Psalms and Proverbs and then go about three chapters to the right. This morning we're going to learn about atonement and substitution. Before we talk about atonement, I want to talk about substitution. The 1828 Webster's Dictionary defines substitution as the act of putting one person or thing in the place of another to supply its place. The act of putting one person or thing in the place of another to supply its place. Now, I'm a substitute crane operator. Well, I, only, I only filled in last week one time. I don't do it that often. I get caught on occasion. Last Friday, I put myself in Brother Matt's place. Brother Matt's also a crane operator. We work for the same company. I put myself in Brother Matt's place so he could go out of town for a funeral. So when we're talking about the substitutionary death of Christ, we're talking about the fact that he stood in our place. Amen? Amen? He stood in our place. He put himself in our place. We're talking about the fact that he stood in our place as sinners and took our punishment so we wouldn't have to. Amen. I showed up for work for Brother Matt so he wouldn't have to. Jesus stood in our place and took our punishment so we wouldn't have to. Amen? Amen. Now we all agree on that, right? Amen. We all agree that Jesus took our place, took our punishment. We all agree with that. But where did he do that? Where did he make atonement? Where did he actually stand in for us? That is, what, that, that is where there is some debate. That is where there is some controversy. Was it on the cross or was it in hell? Now, some say that the atonement had to be finished in hell because that was our punishment. So Jesus had to go to hell to suffer and take our place. Since that's what we deserved, 
He had to go to the same place that we deserve. Now, I've even seen people make statements like this. My price was not a cross. My price was hell, so Jesus had to go to hell to settle the score. But let me tell you, that is man's logic. Let me tell you, that is not New Testament doctrine. That's man-made logic is what that is. See, and the people that make these statements, they don't understand what atonement means. And what they do is they ultimately render the, cry, the cross of Christ as being insufficient. That's ultimately what it boils down to. So let's just talk about the word atonement for a moment. They don't understand what substitution, or, or they don't understand what atonement means. Okay, and I'm going to talk to you about that. Now from the Bible, atonement means to appease. I believe we can all agree if you study it out. I believe we can all agree from the Bible. If you study it out, you, you will come to the conclusion that one of the definitions of atonement is to appease. Now let me read to you the 1828. Listen, listen carefully. Listen carefully to the 1828 definition of atonement. This is definition number two. Satisfaction or reparation made by giving an equivalent for an injury. And that's where people will stop. See there? Had to be equivalent. Had to be hell for hell. I deserved hell, so Jesus had to go to hell and suffer. They say it has, had to be equivalent. But let's not stop there. Let's keep reading. So I'll read it again. Satisfaction or reparation made by giving an equivalent for an injury or, it's a big or, or by doing or suffering that which is received in satisfaction for an offense or injury. Big or there. So atonement doesn't have to be an equivalent. It can be whatever is received in satisfaction. Now when it comes to a, atoning for the sins of the world, the Lord's wrath and judgment being appeased it didn't have to happen the same way as in hell for hell. God can determine whatever it is that satisfies Him. It doesn't have to be an equivalent in God's eyes. Hell for hell. No, it's whatever He determines that would bring Him satisfaction. The definition of atonement said, or by suffering that which is received in satisfaction for an offense. You know what satisfied and appeased the Lord's wrath? The cross. Amen. The cross. And I'll prove it to you. Look at Isaiah 53.10. Got Isaiah 53.10. Yet it pleased, please, underline pleased. Please, underline please. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now that word pleased is very similar to appeased, isn't it? Amen. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, not burn him. Amen. Proves the Lord, Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed. Amen. Notice that. He shall see his seed. God had a seed. All seed means is offspring. Jesus was the father's offspring. Seed doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, of, a, of an egg. <laughs> okay. It means offspring. Jesus Christ was uh, the father's seed. He was his offspring. It says, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Look at verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be what? Satisfied. Satisfied. There's your atonement. Satisfied. Appeased. He sh and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So, so the Father 
was satisfied when he saw the travail of his soul and when he bore their iniquities. Now, where did that happen? Where did it happen when Jesus Christ bore our iniquities? It happened on the cross. So where did God the Father see the travail of his soul? On the cross. The context of verse 11 is on the cross. The travail of his soul and the bearing of our iniquities uh, that satisfied the Father was on the cross. Amen. Amen. It was on the cross. Now it says, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Uh, back up, look at verse 10 again. It says, yet it pleased him. So he was pleased uh, and, 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 uh, when the Lord was bruised and put to grief and his soul was made an offering for sin. Now, Sometimes soul is just referring to a person in general. That doesn't necessarily mean that his soul, that, doesn't, that does not mean, it absolutely does not mean that his soul was an offering for sin in hell. Because that would have been twice suffering. Okay? But sometimes soul is just referring to a person in general. You poor soul. Don't we say that sometimes? So sometimes soul is being referred to as a person in general. But I, I, I don't think that's the case here. I believe this is actually referring to Jesus' soul being made an offering for sin. But where was it made an offering for sin? On the cross. <laughs> he shall see the travail of his soul. Where was that? On the cross. Talks about when he uh, bear our, bore our iniquities. When was that? On the cross. I believe that Jesus Christ, and I have a sermon the Lord willing I'll preach one day, it's called the hell of the cross. I believe that while hanging on that cross, Jesus felt everything that in his soul that we would have felt if we would have went to hell. That's right, brother. Amen. Amen. All the pain, the agony, the suffering, the torment, we would have felt in hell. Jesus felt that in his soul while he was on that cross. Amen. The hell of the cross. I believe he felt that while he was hanging on that cross. Now the punishment that our Savior was dealt on that cross was enough to please, appease, and satisfy the Father. Amen. It didn't have to be equivalent hell for hell. You know why? Because that wasn't even possible. Uh, an equivalent hell for hell was not possible. Why? Think about this. Even if Jesus, let's just pretend Jesus went to hell to suffer for our sins for three days and they say, okay, it had to be an equivalent. That's not equivalent. Because I didn't owe three days. You didn't owe three days. You owed an eternity. So how are you going to say that's equivalent? It's not equivalent. We owed an eternity, not three days. People say, well, my price is not a cross. My price was hell. Well, our price wasn't three days Amen. in hell. Our price was an eternity. Amen. Some say, well, God crammed eternity into three days. Okay, first of all, that's not biblical. Amen. Show me that somewhere in the Bible. That's not biblical. That's extra biblical. First of all, that's not biblical. But second of all, I thought eternal meant eternal. Amen. So, you know, I guess if God could cram an eternity into three days, then eternal really doesn't mean eternal, and maybe we could lose our salvation after all. I guess our salvation isn't really that eternal after all. I guess it could be temporary. Maybe we could just keep it for three days or three months or three years. See how that teaching cheapens and weakens the word eternal? Amen. Eternal means eternal. God didn't cram an eternity uh, uh, in three days because eternal means eternal. And we want to keep the word eternal strong for the gospel's sake. Amen. Eternal means eternal, not three days. It means eternal. And let me just say this, if you boil it all down, I don't see how a person can believe in eternal security and say that Jesus 
died in hell. I don't see it. A lot of things have come to light over the last two years since I've been studying this thing out. And I don't see how someone can believe in eternal security. If you believe Jesus died in hell and suffered in hell, I don't see how you can believe in eternal security. Because 1 John 5.20 says that Jesus is the true God and eternal life. Amen. He is eternal life. Eternal life does not suffer in hell, folks. Amen. You know what? Jesus also had faith. Galatians 2.20 says, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Look, people with faith in the Lord... And people with eternal life don't suffer in hell. Right. Jesus had faith in the Lord. Jesus had, He was eternal life. Amen. He had eternal life because He was eternal life. And when you have faith in the Lord, faith in Jesus Christ, and you have eternal life, you don't suffer. Suffering's off the table. It's off the table. It's not a possibility. Amen? Amen. That's why this teaching goes against eternal security. Now watch this. Listen carefully to this statement. If people can believe that our eternity in hell was supposedly condensed and crammed into three days of Jesus burning in hell, then why can't they understand that that same punishment was crammed in the cross? So you can cram it into three days in hell, but you can't cram it. God, God had the power to cram it into three days in hell, but He couldn't. He lacked the power to cram it into the cross. I don't understand it. How people can say that, well, there had to be an equivalent. It had to be hell. Well, it wasn't equivalent because it wasn't eternity. And I don't understand how you think God could do that in hell, three days in hell, but He couldn't do it on the cross. Well, He did do it on the cross. Amen. He did do it on the cross, and I'll tell you why. Because I want to tell you what the equivalent of a sinner burning in hell forever to the Father is. Here's the equivalent. The, the equivalent of a sinner burning in hell forever to the Father is this. Here's what it is. It's God the Son taking on human flesh and living a sinless life and paying for the sins of the world on the cross, that's what satisfied Him and that's what pleased Him and that's what He deemed as equivalent to a sinner burning in hell for all eternity. Amen. <clears throat> now the biblical word for that is propitiation. Amen. Propitiation. Now listen to Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of, remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. That's what satisfied, that's what propitiated, satisfied our, the Father, God the Father. What God the Son did, God the Son was the propitiator. Okay? And what he did on the cross was the propitiation. Now let me read you the definition uh, of propitiation. 1828. 1828, Webster's defini definition of propitiation. The act of appeasing wrath. Amen. Now where was the propitiation for our sins made? Where the blood was shed. Amen. Let me just read you the verse here in Romans 3.25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. The propitiation was made where the blood was shed. Now something as big as the atoning process, you better know that if Jesus had to suffer in hell to accomplish that, you better know it would be mentioned somewhere in the Bible. And you also better know that it would be necessary to believe in for salvation. You have to have faith in that which propitiates. Faith in the blood. Faith in His bloody death. Faith in the burial. Faith in the resurrection. Amen. So folks, where was the propitiation for our sins made? It's made on the cross. Amen. Atoned on the cross. 
The eternal redemption, I preached that sermon, the eternal redemption of the cross. We were eternally redeemed by the cross. Sure, he had to rise from the grave on the third day. Sure, he had to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Or, his bloody death would have been disqualified by technicality. But the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 12, before he even entered in to the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, he had already obtained eternal redemption for us because that was done on the cross. Amen? Amen. The act of appeasing wrath was done on the cross. Now let me give you some application. Let's rejoice and be reminded that the scapegoat took our sins into the wilderness. Amen. Amen. Let's be reminded and rejoice that the scapegoat, Jesus Christ, took our sins into the wilderness. Now, no doubt, in this room, I know for a fact in this room, there's been abortions. There's been adultery. There's been stealing from family members. There's uh, been drug use and drunkenness. But guess what? He carried those things into the wilderness, praise God. Amen. He carried them into the wilderness. Recently, I was reading Acts 21.3. Let me read you a portion from this verse here in Acts 21.3. It says, They sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlade her burden. That ship was to unlade her burden. You know what some of you need to do? You need to make like this ship. You need to unlade your burden. You need to quit carrying around the things that Jesus took to the wilderness. If he took it to a place that is not inhabited, then why do you try to inhabit that place? Why do you go back and try to wallow in those sins? Every time you go back and you dig up your past and fret over your past, you're trying to go to a place that's supposed to be uninhabited. Amen? Amen. Amen. Leave those sins where Jesus deposited them. Amen. Leave those sins in that inhabited place place. 1 Peter 5, 7 Casting all your care upon Him for He careth for you. Amen. You need to unlaid your burden. You need to cast those things upon Him. He cares for you. I mean, that's why He bore your sins and took your sins upon Him to start with. Man, I love that part when we're reading here, through here and it kept saying over again. It says in verse 21, Leviticus 16, 21 I'll, I'll read it for you. Listen. It says And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins. Amen. Man, I was getting excited when I was reading that. Because what was it? That was reminding us of Jesus Christ, the fit man. Amen. The fit man, the scapegoat who took all our sins. He took all our iniquities, all our sins, all our transgressions. Amen. Amen. And you had to cast all that junk on him. Quit trying to bear that load. That's why you came to Him to start with. To give Him your load. Give Him those sins you were trying to take care of on your own. Colossians 2.13 And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath He quickened together with Him having, for, having forgiven you all trespasses. All trespasses. Did it say some? Did it say a few? No, all. All trespasses. Do you think any fell through the cracks? Do you think that, uh, you know, uh, your unfaithfulness on your spouse many, many years ago fell through the cracks? Do you think that abortion many, many years ago fell through the cracks? No. If He can forgive you, you need to forgive yourself. Amen? You need to be able to forgive yourself. Psalms 103, verse 3, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Amen? Amen. Number one, let's rejoice and be reminded that He took our sins to the wilderness. The fit man, the scapegoat, the Lord Jesus Christ, He took all our sins to the wilderness. Glory be to God. Amen. Hey, and he who uh, has, has been forgiven much, loveth much. Amen. Because He did that, let's love Him. Right. Because He did that, let's serve Him. Because He bore the travail of our sins and, and, and experienced uh, the hell of the cross. Amen. Let's love Him. Amen. Because He uh, forgave us and took all our sins. Let's love Him. 
Number one, let's rejoice and be reminded he took our sins into the wilderness. So let's be reminded we've been forgiven much, so we ought to love much. What did Jesus say? He that uh, loveth me does what? Keeps my commandments. Amen. Number two, let's be thankful for the cross and emphasize the cross as the pinnacle and the highlight of our Savior's ministry. Amen? Amen. Now let's emphasize that in our soul winning. The cross, the bloody cross of our Savior. Let's be soldiers of the cross, Amen. not soldiers of hell. Let's be soldiers of the cross. Amen? Amen. Miss Amber, if you'll come at this time, please.